Your skull is not one large bone. It is composed of many bones, and many of those bones are actually paired. And we can subdivide those bones into two general types of bones. You have the cranial bones, which surround the cranial cavity, where your, bo where your brain is located. And then you have the facial bones. The facial bones, as their name implies, are found in the face. They surround the oral cavity, the eye orbits, as well as the nasal cavity. You're now looking at an anterior view of the skull. I want you to think of the skull as like a house. So we're going to take the house and we're going to turn it upside down and we're going to look down onto the underside of the house. You would be looking at the basement of the house. In the case of the skull, this is called the base of the skull. From the base of the skull, there are only two bones that I could ask you to identify. Only two from this view. And those are the bones of the hard palate. The hard palate makes up the hard roof of your mouth. It is composed of two bones. Color coded here in green is the palatine bone. And then you have the paired maxillary bones here, one on the right and one on the left. These are the only bones that I might ask you to identify from this view. However, there are quite a few bone features I could ask you to identify. Let's start with the foramen. We have the foramen magnum, which allows the spinal cord to pass through it. Magnum means large, and as you can see, it's a very large foramen. We have the jugular foramen, named for the jugular vein that passes through, and anterior to those are the carotid canals, named for the carotid artery that passes through. And the last foramen I could ask you to identify from this view would be the foramen ovale, so named because they are roughly oval in shape. There are a couple of other features I could ask you to identify. They include these condyles here. These are called occipital condyles because they're on the occipital bone. These structures rest on the first cervical vertebrae. And that first cervical vertebrae you'll learn a little about in another screencast. And lastly, these depressions here on the temporal bone are called mandibular fossa. Remember, a fossa is a depression typically at a joint. Your mandible or jawbone attaches to the temporal bones right here at the mandibular fossa. The mandible or jawbone, by the way, is the, <clears throat> is the only bone that moves. This is the only movable joint on the skull. All the other joints are immovable joints. We're now going to turn our skull right back side up again. And if you recall, I said, think of the skull as like a house. So now we're going to have a bit of a house party. And it's going to be a real happening party. And we're going to raise the roof. And when we raise the roof, we're going to be looking down into the skull at what is called the floor of the skull. We raise the roof and now we're looking down at the floor. Just to orient you, this is the anterior side, this is the posterior side. As you can see, there are various bones I could ask you to identify from this viewpoint as well as features. Here we have the frontal bone, the small bone here, and this is another bone. This is not the frontal bone. What I'm outlining here is called the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone has two features. This Projection here is called the Christagalli, means coxcomb, so it, because it sort of looks like the comb of a rooster. And then here, with all these little small holes, this is the cribriform plate. This bone here looks sort of like a bat's wing, is called the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone has a feature here called the 
Sela Tersica literally means Turkish saddle. It has a depression here, and this is where your pituitary gland sits. And we'll talk about your pituitary gland once we get to the endocrine system. Posterior and lateral to the ethmoid bone, we have the temporal bones here and here. And then here we have the occipital bone. Again, we have those foramen, foramen magnum, the, um, here is the jugular foramen, and here is the foramen ovale. You can't really see the carotid canal from this view. This is a lateral view of the skull. I'm going to run through the bones and bone features that you can see from this view in the hopes that this will help you when you are going through your lab manual with your study guide identifying the bone and bones and their various features. Making up your forehead is the frontal bone, very aptly named. Posterior and lateral to the frontal bone are the parietal bones. There's one on each side, you can't see the other. And not shown here, but there's a suture, which are basically immovable joints between your cranial bones. There's a suture here between this right parietal bone and the left parietal bone. And that suture is called the sagittal suture. And it's so named because it is in the sagittal plane. I'll also, also note that you have a suture right here between the frontal bone and the parietal bones, and that's called the coronal suture because it's in the coronal or frontal plane. This is the temporal bone here, rather large bone here. Temporal bone has several features you're responsible for identifying. One is the ear canal called the external acoustic meatus, so this is the a canal of your ear and right behind your ear if you take your hand and feel right behind your ear there's this large bony projection here and that's called the mastoid process go ahead and feel that on your own body it's something that I'm sure you've felt before and that and now you're just learning what the name of it of it is it's the mastoid process also know this little projection here which is called the styloid process same name as similar projections on the ulna and radius that you learned about last week this bone here your cheekbone is the zygomatic bone the zygomatic bone has a projection here called the temporal process so right here is a temporal process interesting enough the temporal bone here has a process here which is called the zygomatic process. Together the temporal process and the zygomatic process make up the zygomatic arch. Okay, so make sure you can distinguish all of those. Again, this is the temporal process here. This is the zygomatic process here of the temporal bone, and together they make up the zygomatic arch. Now I know you're thinking, wait a minute, why do they call this the zygomatic process when it's part of the temporal bone, and they call this the temporal process and it's part of the zygomatic bone? Well, I want to use an analogy. Let's say this is Minnesota, and this is Wisconsin, and this is a bridge between the two states. Well, on the Wisconsin side, what do they call this bridge? Well, they call it the Minnesota Bridge because it's the bridge to Minnesota. Well, what do they call this bridge on the Minnesota side? They call it the Wisconsin Bridge because it's the bridge to Wisconsin. So sort of think of them like that. Lastly, the other, only other bone I'll identify from this uh, view will be the maxillary bone here, and there are two of them. And when we look at the anterior view, we'll look at them as well. Uh, and then here we have the occipital bone. I said there was going to be only one, but uh, I had forgotten about the occipital bone here.
This is an anterior view of the skull. Again, we have the frontal bone of the forehead. Here are maxillary, excuse me, zygomatic bones, the cheekbones. Here are maxilla or maxillary bones. They're, they are paired as are most bones of the skull. Here's our mandible here. These small bones here are called lacrimal bones. Lacrimal means tears. And I guess they're so named because a lot of times tears move from this direction to this direction and then they move over our cheek. And here we have the nasal bones. Now you see bones here in the eye orbits and they include some of the cranial bones such as the sphenoid bones. However, I will not, I repeat, not ask you to identify any of the bones from the eye orbit. The only bone near the eye orbit I could ask you to identify would be the lacrimal bones. I will never ask you to identify the sphenoid bone or any of the cranial bones from the eye orbit. As we are viewing the eye orbit, there are two fissures that you need to be able to identify. This is the superior orbital fissure, and this is the inferior orbital fissure. Just try to remember what superior and inferior means. This one is superior to this one. Muscles that move the eye pass through these fissures. And this round foramen here, I said this was a foramen, it's actually a canal. A foramen is a whole a canal is a tube. This is the optic canal. The optic nerve passes through this opening. Lastly, let's look at the nasal cavity here. Here we have an extension from the ethmoid bone, which is called the perpendicular plate. And inferior to it, we have the vomer, which means plow, because it looks sort of like a plow from, uh, from a lateral view. So perpendicular plate, vomer. The perpendicular plate, by the way, is a bone feature. It's an extension of the ethmoid bone, which we saw around here in the floor of the skull. The vomer is its own bone. This is the middle nasal concha. This is an inferior nasal concha. These are processes that extend from the lateral walls of the nasal cavity and they cause air to bounce around the nasal cavity. And you'll learn the more of how this works, but as air enters the nasal cavity and bounces around the mucosa or mucous membrane lining the nasal cavity, it helps filter um, particles out of the air and also helps humidify and warm the air as it enters. I wanted to show you those nasal concha from another view. This is the sagittal head model here on the right. So imagine cutting the skull right down the middle and opening it like a book. This is what you would see here. So here's the frontal bone here. This is the nose and then behind the nose, the nasal cavity. This, the inferior nasal concha, that is what you see here. This is the middle nasal concha, that is what you see here on the sagittal head. And then there is also a superior nasal concha, but you can't see it uh, from an anterior view of the skull. Be able to identify the nasal concha from the sagittal head model as well as a skull. We will complete our discussion of the skull by taking a look at the fetal skull and identifying a couple of structures found on it. There is no image of the fetal skull in your lab manual. I will have to refer you to your textbook. Currently it is figure 5.32. When you were born, 
all of your cranial bones were not fused together. They had spaces between them, and those spaces were covered by a thick membrane called fontanelle. You know them as soft spots. There are two fontanelle that you have to identify. They are the anterior fontanelle here and the posterior fontanelle here. On this uh, lateral view, here would be the anterior, here is, and the posterior would be back here. Although you don't have to know this, for lab, you're probably wondering, what are the functions of these fontanelle? Well, the human brain grows very quickly the first couple of years after parturition or birth, particularly the first year. And so we want to allow the brain to grow. And so these fontanelle allow the cranium to expand as the brain grows. In fact, if the, these fontanelle close too early, early would be typically less than two years of age before they fully close, it would actually compress the brain and can actually cause brain damage and death. That's one of the reasons if you uh, have experienced this, when you take a, a child to see the pediatrician the first year or so, they always measure brain circu head circumference to make sure that the cranium is indeed expanding. Also, um, the fontanelle allows compression of the skull during the birthing process. Uh, you've probably, if you've ever seen a, the head of a child after a vaginal birth, it tends to be sort of cone shaped as these cranial bones shift. If you haven't seen that, um, it is something that is very normal. So if you have a, a baby born vaginally and the head is misshapen, don't worry. Uh, in most cases, it very quickly returns to a more normal conformation. In approaching the material of the skull, learning the bones and bone features, my suggestion is that you just go systematically through the tables in your lab manual. They list all the bones and under the bones, the bone features that you have to know, and they describe them. So as you read what they are and the descriptions of where they are, find them on the images. I think your book does an excellent job of walking you through the skull. Consult your study guide to figure out if you're responsible for a specific bone feature. Most of the bone features you are, but there are some that you are not. For example, on the frontal bone, an important marking it refers to is the supraorbital foramen. If you look on your study guide under frontal bone, you will not find the supraorbital foramen, which means you don't have to know it. So, use your lab manual to walk you through the skull. It does an excellent job. In fact, I learned the anatomy of the skull by um, using this process. It's very effective.